Okay, uh, I think we're good to go. So just a brief recap of where we got to on uh, Friday's lecture. So what we've done, uh, we started pretty simply. We just added a source that was upstream of a sink and we added a uniform flow coming from right to left which gave us this uh, full ranking body. So source plus sink plus uniform flow. And what we did on, so that closed that half ranking body. And then what we did on Friday, uh, you know, through this usual procedure of finding the stagnation points, finding the value of the stream function that passes through those stagnation points, we managed to find the equation for the separatrix, all right? Which is really uh, this, this equation given at the bottom of the slides, which is really the equation for that oval shaped full ranking body. And of course, we, c we could replace that. We, we can replace any streamline in that flow field with a solid body. So, you know, we could now simulate the flow around this kind of oval or lozenge-shaped body, uh, which maybe on its own wasn't that useful for us, but it gave us this uh, gateway, I guess, to I explore the doublet, uh, which was this super, superposition of a source and a sink. So that was when things maybe got a bit weird on Friday. So what we did was we said, well... Uh, you know, the, the, the full ranking body has a source placed upstream of the sink, and that source and sink are equidistant about the y-axis by a distance that we've been calling S. And then what we said on Friday, and this is all a recap, okay, but I think it's worth going over. Um, what we said on Friday is let's imagine what's going to happen when we bring that source and sink very close together. So we, then when we let S tend to zero. So... You can kind of, and you, you, you all guess this, right? You can kind of see from that equation for that full ranking body what's going to happen. If I allow s to tend to zero, then x squared plus y squared is going to tend to zero, and that means that that separatrix is basically uh, 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 just going to vanish. It's going to become smaller and smaller as I move that source and sink together, and then uh, 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 as that source and sink really approach each other, that separatrix is just going to effectively... Uh, kind of disappear, okay? Uh, so when that source and sink are exactly co-located, I, I just end up back with that uniform flow and the source and sink have cancelled each other out. But uh, what you also noticed on Friday was that when I bring that source and sink very close together, and this, again, it isn't surprising either from the algebra or when we think of this physically, when I bring that source and sink very close together, that separatrix, which is the red curve on that graph, which is described by those equations at the bottom of that graph, is going to asymptote just before it disappears, 
it's going to asymptote towards being circular. Okay, so, so far, so good. Nothing too weird, I don't think, with that. The sneaky trick was that what we, what we said was, well, to, to stop that source and sink, uh, uh, sorry, to stop that separatrix becoming vanishingly small when that source and sink approaches each other, let's allow the source and sink to become very, very strong indeed as S becomes small. And, and what we did, uh, well, actually, it's written at the top of this slide, is what we said is let's allow the strength of the source and sink Q to equal some constant K divided by S. Okay, so K is a constant, and then as S becomes very small, or, or as S becomes zero, Q is going to become asymptotically large. It's going to tend towards infinity. So now, this, as I bring the source and sink together, this S term tends to zero, this S term tends to zero, but this, what we've done, really, with that sneaky trick, is we've monkeyed around with that cotan term, and, and we've said that that term is going to asymptote to infinity. Okay? So there's some kind of weird asymptotics uh, going on here, but the... Uh, the, the upshot of it all is that if I, if I allow Q to equal K on S and I bring that source and sink together, uh, then that separatrix doesn't become vanishingly small. Uh, and again, you can see that as I bring that source and sink together, now that, that separatrix is asymptoting to a circle, as indeed it should, uh, 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 because this expression now... Uh, the, the asymptotic form of that equation is that x squared plus y squared t should tend towards a constant as s tends towards <coughs> zero. Did that make sense? Did, it, did, with that refresher, does that kind of make sense? All we're trying to do is co-locate a source and sink, and the way that we do that is just to allow them to become infinitely strong, I guess, uh, as, as we co-locate them. So then the other thing that we did on Friday was that we tried to, uh, we don't want to deal with those asymptotics, so we tried to write out a solution for uh, this flow that we're calling the doublet, which is a source and sink co-located, exactly located on top of each other. And we started off by just considering the stream function for a source and a sink, which was just Q on 2 pi theta A minus theta B. And then we said that, well, I, I, just from geometry, I can write that theta A minus theta B is equal to that angle alpha, which is shown in red on this figure. And from then on, through uh, really a mixture of geometry and, and I guess some sneaky tricks, making some small angle approximations, we were able to write out an equation uh, for, the, for the doublet. So, I mean, really... We just defined some geometry associated with that problem. And the main thing that we did was that we said that as, uh, 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 as S becomes very small, theta A is going to tend towards theta B, uh, 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 which is going to tend towards that angle theta, which I've marked in red uh, on, the, on this figure. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, th that, that told us that we could just assume that a lot of these angles on this sketch would tend towards right angles. And then, very simply, I could just write out that alpha, uh, uh, sorry, tan alpha was just equal to that length LA plus LB divided by the length R. Uh, and, and that gave us this, this and, and obviously we could write expressions for LA and LB. And that just gave us this very nice solution for the stream function for a doublet, uh, which was just equal to QS sine theta on pi R. And we've already said that Q was equal to some constant divided by S. So we know, that, uh, we know that QS is just equal to that constant that we've been calling K. Uh, and, and, and so the definition for a doublet, if we're going to consider a doublet as a new building block flow, uh, which, which, which is indeed what we're going to do, we can write that the equation for a doublet is K sine theta on, on, on pi R. Okay. So, again, that doublet is just this case where that source and sink are exactly located on top of each other, okay? And we can express it using this very simple uh, 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 ex expression for the stream function. So we have to go about defining the stream function in that weird way because 
normally when we define the stream function for our building block flows, we wrote out what the U and V components would look like uh, and, and just basically integrated those equations to get an expression for the stream function. In this case, uh, uh, we wouldn't have a clue what U and V would look like, so we're kind of forced into this, uh, uh, this approach of uh, 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 analyzing the geometry of the problem. So this is expressed in cylindrical polar coordinates, um, but, but you'd appreciate that I can just write that um, well, sine theta is just equal to opposite over hypotenuse, okay? So sine theta is just equal to y on r. So if I wanted to express this in Cartesian coordinates, you could see that we just get that psi is equal to k, uh, ky on pi r squared, okay? So, so we can, you know, we can bounce between cylindrical and Cartesian coordinates uh, uh, for that doublet as we see fit. <coughs> Uh, and of course, uh, r, r squared is just x squared plus y squared. Uh, you, you, you all know that. Okay, so somebody asked me on, uh, actually, hang on, let me just stop. Two people came up to me and spoke at the end, and I can't remember who it was, on the end of Friday's lecture and asked me what a dipole was because it's discussed in the they were looking forward in the tutorial problems. And I, and, I, and I kind of, it was Friday afternoon, I was having a brain fart and I couldn't remember. But uh, a dipole is just another word for a doublet, okay? So I guess you've come across dipole, the concept of a dipole when you, when you talk about, uh, when, you're, when, you're, when you're discussing atomic physics, when you have two, uh, two opposite charges that are very uh, close together. So dipole is just another word for, for a doublet. So throughout the lectures, I'm using the term doublet, but just remain uh, uh, aware of the fact that people might call it a dipole. So also in Friday's lecture, somebody asked me what the streamline pattern uh, associated with that doublet looked like, um, uh, uh, or the streamline pattern within that uh, circular separatrix. And we can look at that very simply. There's a very elegant and simple uh, solution that's staring us in the face from, from this expression. So this is the equation, th this is the equation, this is a stream function for a doublet in Cartesian coordinates, and we know that lines of constant stream function are streamlined, so all I've got to do is set this equation equal to some constant c, uh, and rearrange that equation, and it's going to give me the equation for the streamlines associated with the doublet, all right? So uh, streamlines are when ky on pi x squared plus y squared are equals to a constant. If I rearrange, I get x squared plus y squared is equal to ky on, uh, on, 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 on c pi. And then if I gather those terms involving w y together, well, actually, if I rewrite this term, uh, if, I, if I rewrite this term in, in the form of the expression for a circle, you can see that that's just telling me that the streamlines are circular. So I'm just rewriting this equation now so that I've got x squared plus y uh, minus some constant squared is equal to some constant. And if you compare that to the equation for a circle, uh, hopefully you can persuade yourself that those streamlines are just going to be uh, circular. Can everybody see that? So, and, and there's something weird here, right? Because that, that, that first bracketed term, y minus k on 2 pi c, that k on 2 pi c is the offset of the origin of those circular streamlines. Uh, and, and then that, that term on the right-hand side, k squared on 4 pi squared c squared, is the radius squared. So what can you see about the radius and the offset? Too, 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 too obvious to even say. So the radius is the same as the offset, okay? So, and, and you'd have to think about this a little bit in order to sketch the problem. Uh, so the offset is k on 2 pi c, and the radius squared is k squared on 4 pi squared c squared, and what you should see is just r is equal to y naught. So what we have here is a family of stri circular streamlines, uh, all of which uh, pass through the origin 0, comma 0. And if, we, uh, if I plot what that streamline pattern looks like, it, it's an arrangement of circular streamline patterns uh, that, that looks like this, this kind of 
uh, double roller pattern, and you see that all of those circular streamlines pass through the origin 0, 0. So if I choose any one of those, the offset is that distance k on 2 pi c, and the radius, uh, 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 the radius of that circle is, um, is, is um, k, also k on 2 pi c. Uh, Okay. Um, okay. So, th so does that make sense? I, I still feel like if I was staring at the equation, it might have been tricky for me just to figure out how to sketch that streamline pattern. And I guess MATLAB's very useful in these situations. But really, all the information we needed was in that algebraic solution. Okay. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is that that doublet. I know that it seems weird because we mashed a source and a sink together so that they're co-located and we allowed the strength to asymptote towards infinity, but that doublet has a direction. The flow, uh, if you watch my, if you can see my cursor, the flow is coming out of the origin and then it's flowing in this, uh, it, it, it's flowing in this counterclockwise direction around those streamlines. And that was because when I, when, when we derived that equation for a doublet and we allowed s to tend to zero, we had the source uh, at, at, at positive x, and we had, the, sorry, we had the source at positive s in the x direction and the sink at, at, at negative s. So I could, uh, I could just as easily, uh, by adding a negative sign in front of that equation for, for the stream function for doublet, I could generate an anti-sign doublet where the flow was heading in the other direction, all right? So, anyway, uh, I'll tell you why this is significant. I'll try and show you why that's significant. So, if I, if I now take a doublet and I add a uniform flow that's coming from right to left, then, uh, oh, again, we should be able to sketch this, okay? What do you think is going to happen to those street, these uniform flow streamlines, the ones that are coming from the right, when they meet that doublet? What do you reckon is going to happen to those streamlines? <coughs> Nothing? Who cares? <laughs> uh, you, you will care, I guess, uh, uh, a, a few weeks into swap vac. But, um, so, so the, I mean, I, I, I don't think there's any shame, actually, in you not knowing what happens to those streamlines. It's very, very hard to just look at these flows and figure what the topology of the flow looks like. But I would suggest you get some, uh, you try and get as much practice as you can. So, actually, we know that when those streamlines come close to each other, they have to be heading in the same direction. So, I, I guess in this case, you might assume that when those uniform flow meets that doublet, it has, to, it has to follow around that pattern of those circular streamlines. You see how that flow is kind of rolling in this direction. So that flow has to kind of roll around that doublet in that direction. All right? And actually, it's a little bit boring. The flow just parts around that doublet, and then it comes back together again downstream uh, a bit behind that doublet. And, and actually, we should have known that from the... Remember, this is just a squished up full ranking body, so we should have known, remember it's just a full ranking body that's like got a, instead of that oval shape, it's tending towards a circular shape. So we, we should have been able to guess this. So the reason I mention this sign is because it's important. If we had the sign of that doublet incorrect, so I've now, uh, uh, I've now got the stream function for my doublet with a minus k, so minus ky on pi x squared plus y squared, uh, what do you think is going to happen now? So now the flow is coming out of the origin and it's flowing in that, on the top of that doublet, it's flowing in that clockwise direction. What do you think is going to happen to those streamlines now? It, it's going to get sucked in, right? It's going to be like a, it's like a roller, it's like a mangle. It's just going to, those streamlines from that uniform flow are just going to get sucked into that singularity effectively at the origin of that doublet. And that's completely... In my mind, that's useless in terms of simulating flows, but the only reason I put it up there is just to uh, uh, warn you of how important that sign is uh, uh, for the doublet uh, of this particular, uh, in, in, uh, for this flow that we're trying to build. So anyway, 
let's write out the equation for that doublet plus a uniform flow, all right? And we're going to go through the usual process of finding the stagnation points and finding the equation for the separatrix, but we already know what the separatrix is going to look like, right? <coughs> One of you is nodding. Uh, can you tell me what the separatrix is going to look like? This is useful, useful feedback for me, you see, because I, I can tell whether you were listening to five minutes ago. It's a... Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right, okay, because we kind of showed that when we ran that source and sink from the full ranking body together, that separatrix became a streamline. But let's just uh, torture ourselves and go through a, a few minutes of algebra just so that we can actually get the... We don't need the equation for that circle, but we do need the location for the stagnation points. That's going to be useful for us. So all we've got to do is differentiate... Well, first of all, you all understand that equation at the top by now. It's just telling me that the stream function is just the uniform flow plus the doublet. Uh, you all know how to set up the problem in that way. And then if I want to write out expressions for the u and v component of velocity, I just differentiate psi with respect to y to get the u component. Uh, and obviously, uh, that minus u infinity y is just going to become minus u infinity when I differentiate with respect to y, uh, y, you've got to make your peace with being able to differentiate that doublet expression with respect to y. I guess you're using the, 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 the quotient rule here, uh, but there's many shortcuts that you should have learned uh, throughout all your math course to be able to do that differentiation. But again, uh, uh, practice now uh, prevents you embarrassing yourself uh, come tutorials or exam time. So please just go through these problems and check that you can do it. And then for the V component, it's just minus d psi dx. Um, and again, this interesting thing that we noted uh, in, in, in last week's lecture, that that uniform flow doesn't figure at all in that vertical component of velocity. We just have to differentiate the expression for the doublet with respect to x. And then all we've got to do is find stagnation points where u and v are, 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 are both equal to, uh, are both equals to, to zero. So if we look at that equation for v, uh, you can see that v is zero if x or y is equal to zero. Uh, so on both v, v, is, v is zero on both of those lines of symmetry through this flow. But I, I think uh, I would hope by now that you'd realize that the stagnation points are, are going to lie uh, somewhere along the x-axis for this flow, that's flow, that uniform flow that's moving in the x-direction. So I think the more useful case for us to look at is the case where y is equal to 0. Okay? So v is 0 when x or y equals 0, but let's just look along the x-axis because I know that's where the stagnation points are going to be. And, and you should know that's where the stagnation points are going to be also. So I just substitute y equals 0 into that equation for u. Uh, so those y naught terms just disappear. Uh, and you can see that uh, uh, one of these x naught squared terms disappears. And I just get this very simple solution that the stagnation points are located at plus or minus square root k on pi u infinity, all right? So we've got a stagnation point upstream and downstream of the doublet, and that distance of that stagnation point from the doublet, which is at the origin, is just square root k on pi u, u infinity. By the way, a lot of this is in your printed lecture notes. Uh, there should be, there, there was a red box that told you what page it's on. I think it's page uh, 48 in, in your PDF lecture notes. So I know where the I know where the stagnation point it, it, I know where the stagnation points are located. I can obviously just poke those uh, uh, coordinates for the stagnation points back into the equation for the stream function, and I know that the separatrix then is just going to be a line of constant stream function uh, uh, where the stream function is equal to zero. So the equation for the separatrix is just when this equation for that stream function is set to zero. Uh, so if I set psi equals to zero, 
I just get u infinity y is equal to ky on pi x squared plus y squared. You can see that that y, one of those y's just cancels on the left and right hand side and we get that simple equation for the separatrix or that proof really uh, uh, that, the, that the separate, before we knew that the separatrix was going to be x squared plus y squared was equal to a constant, I guess the, the, the addition that we now know is what that constant is equal to. And, uh, 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 and we've just got the, uh, the separatrix is just a circle with radius square root pi, uh, square root k on pi u infinity. Does that make sense to everybody? Kind of didn't need to do that, right? Because we knew where the stagnation points were. We knew the separatrix was a circle that had to go through the stagnation point. So I knew it was a circle that had a radius that was equal to the location of that stagnation point. So kind of a redundant step, I guess, but it only took us uh, a few seconds to get there. So separatrix is a, radius, a circle of radius, uh, which I, and I'm going to call the radius of that circle A, uh, which is just square root k on pi u infinity. So we've got stagnation points upstream and downstream of the doublet, and we've got a, 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 a circular separatrix that, that's passing, um, passing through those <coughs> stagnation points. So, uh, and, and there's also a, th there's also another streamline that passes through those stagnation points, which is this horizontal streamline. So there's another separatrix actually uh, uh, that features in this that, that features in this flow. And that, of course, was the, the solution with y equals zero that we substituted into that equation earlier on. So I can replace that, any of those streamlines with a solid body. So I can replace that, uh, that circular separatrix with a solid body. And we now, uh, what we now have is a simulation of the flow around a cylinder. Okay, uh, re remember that we've got this 2D assumption. So it's the flow around a cylinder, not the flow around a sphere. Uh, that, that, that shape is uh, infinite in the direction into the page. And again, I can replace any of those other streamlines with a solid body if I so desired. So I, I could also, for example, replace that horizontal separatrix with a solid body, and I could use this to simulate a flow over a hemispherical bump on a wall. Um, I'm not entirely sure where that might be useful for you, but... The, the, the point is that the cylinder, I can tell you for now, the cylinder is going to be useful for us. Um, this one, I'm not so sure. But just be aware of the fact that you can replace uh, any streamline that you want with a, with a solid boundary. All right, so what are we doing now? So we, we, we know that that doublet and that uniform flow can simulate the flow around the cylinder, um, and we can we can plot that streamline pattern around the cylinder. Uh, but again, what 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 do I what do I typically what what are we really heading towards here? Isn't just plotting pretty streamlines, right? There was what do we typically want to calculate as engineers? Forces. See, you're all learning the answers to my dumb questions, which is good. All right, we want to calculate forces. Uh, uh, acting on that cylinder, okay? So I'm going to want to make use of, 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 Bernoulli's, uh, of Bernoulli's equation. But, so, w Bernoulli's equation will give me the, the, the pressure anywhere within the flow field, but where in particular do I need to know that, that pressure in order to calculate the, the, the forces acting on the cylinder? On the surface. On the surface, right? So, in, and then in order to be able to calculate the pressure acting on the surface of the cylinder, uh, if you think your way through Bernoulli's equation, what does that mean that I need to know on the surface of the cylinder? What's the relationship between pressure and velocity, right? So I need to know the velocity on the surface of that cylinder, uh, which is what we're heading towards, right? So I'm not just mindlessly torturing you here by... Uh, 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 keep changing between Cartesian and cylindrical polar coordinates. I'm trying to make life easier for us. So that doublet plus a uniform flow simulates a cylinder, and, th and that cylinder has a radius that's equal to square root k on pi u infinity. 
So we can make use of that, right? Because when you think about it, the equation for the stream function that we had for that doublet plus that uniform flow uh, was written, the doublet had this constant k in there that was this kind of uh, uh, mystery strength, which was that trick that we made to a... Uh, uh, it was that trick that we affected so that source and sink didn't just disappear when they were co-located. But you'll see that what I can do now is just rewrite that k on pi term in, in terms of that cylinder radius a. So I can actually get rid of that mystery constant k out of this problem altogether, right? I can just say that k on pi is equal to u infinity a squared, and I can substitute that into that equation for the stream function for this doublet plus that uniform flow. And I think it's a much more, that k, physically that k is somewhat meaningless to us, all right? But now we're just rewriting it specifically in terms of the radius of the cylinder that, that, that we're going to be, that, that we're going to be simulating. Okay, so, and remember, I'm not torturing you. What we want is the velocity on the surface of the cylinder. And describing the velocity all the way around the surface of that cylinder in Cartesian coordinates is going to be a huge pain. Um, so it's much easier just to switch into cylindrical polar coordinates uh, and, 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 and work out those, uh, uh, those radial and azimuthal components of velocity rather than u and v. So switching this... Uh, to, to cylindrical coordinates is very simple. I know that sine theta is equal to opposite on hypotenuse, so sine theta is just equal to y on uh, is just equal to, to to y on r, and I know that x squared plus y squared is just equal to r squared. So uh, so y just becomes uh, so y just becomes r sine theta, and that x squared plus y squared just becomes r squared. And I can very simply write out that equation for the stream function in terms of cylindrical polar coordinates uh, rather than the Cartesian expression that we, that we originally had. So, and then all I'm doing is both of those terms have a u infinity sine theta in them, so I can just gather it together into this very compact form for that doublet plus a uniform flow. Um, and this, later on, we'll probably use this as a starting point because this flow around a cylinder almost becomes another building block for us uh, uh, when we move on to the latter stages of this, latter stages of this course. Okay, so now to find u theta and u r, uh, what I've got to do is differentiate that equation for the stream function. Um, You've probably forgotten all of this, but if you look all the way back to the first week of this uh, course, uh, we discussed uh, how you can express the stream function in Cartesian coordinates, and you can also express the stream function in terms of cylindrical polar coordinates. And you should be comfortable at switching between the two. Um, you should be able to derive these expressions, but I have to say that you should really just walk into the exam knowing them. Uh, I, you, you don't want to be wasting time on this. So ur is equal to 1 on r d psi d theta. Um, uh, so all I've got to do is differentiate that equation for psi with respect to theta. And, and that's very simple, right? The only term in there that's a function of theta is that sine theta. And the, uh, 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 and the differential of sine theta is just cos theta. So that's pretty straightforward for me. And likewise, uh, to calculate u theta, uh, which is maybe a little bit more tricky, I've got to take that equation for the stream function. Actually, it's not more tricky. It's really, a, it's really simple, right? We've just got to differentiate minus psi with respect to, with, with, with respect to r. Um, so we're, just dis we're basically just differentiating 1 on r or minus 1 on r with respect to r, which is going to be uh, 1 on r squared, and we're differentiating r with respect to r, which is just going to be plus 1. So very, very straightforward to get those uh, radial and azimuthal components of velocity uh, 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 fr from that in, in cylindrical polar coordinates. So what do I set r to if I want the velocity on the surface of the cylinder? It's not a trick question. 
A, all right? So if I set R equals to A, you can see that for the radial component of velocity, that bracketed term is just going to become 1 minus 1, so it's just going to disappear. And, and for that u theta term, that bracketed, uh, that bracketed term for u theta is just going to become 1 plus 1, uh, which is equal, I hope you would see, is equal to 2, all right? So what we've got is that the radial component of velocity is 0, and the azimuthal component of velocity is 2u infinity sine theta. And there you see the beauty of switching this into cylindrical polar coordinates. We should have known that the radial component of velocity was equal to zero, right? Do, do you get why I should have known that the radial component of velocity was zero? Be, be, because that, that circular separatrix is a streamline, and we know that there's only flow tangential to a streamline, not normal to it, okay? And in this case, where that streamline is a perfect circle, I should have known that you are was, equal to, was already equal to zero. Okay, so now all we've got to do is apply Bernoulli's equation between some position upstream and some location on the surface of that cylinder. We choose a position well upstream where we, as engineers, we would know what P infinity, ambient pressure, and what U infinity, the free stream velocity, was going to be. And then we just apply Bernoulli's equation between that point and some point on the surface of the cylinder. So we've got from Bernoulli's, which remember we can apply between any two points for an irrotational flow. We've got that P infinity plus a half row U infinity squared is equal to PC plus a half row UC squared. So subscript C uh, I'm using for on the surface of the cylinder and capital U subscript C is the magnitude of velocity at that surface of the cylinder. So I can rejig Bernoulli's to get an expression, uh, expression um, to get an expression for PC minus P infinity. And then, obviously, that's the term that I need into that equation for the pressure coefficient, or that I need to substitute into my equation for the pressure coefficient. So Bernoulli's gives me PC minus P infinity, which I can just substitute into the equation for the pressure coefficient CP. Uh, and what I get is that the pressure coefficient around this cylinder is just equal to 1 minus uh, uc on u infinity squared. And, and, and what you should, that, that uc term is very, very straightforward, okay? uc is the magnitude of the velocity at the surface of the cylinder, which is just equal to square root of ur squared plus u theta squared, and we know that ur squared is equal to zero, so the, the, the magnitude of the velocity at the surface of the cylinder is just equal to that azimuthal component of the velocity u, u, u theta. So all I have to do is substitute the equation for u theta into this expression. Those u infinities cancel, and you get this very nice uh, analytical form for the pressure coefficient or the pressure distribution around a cylinder in a uniform <coughs> flow, which is just 1 minus 4 sine squared, uh, 1 minus 4 sine squared theta, which again we're going to come back to at later stages of this course, so it's going to become useful for us. All right, so if I plot that equation in MATLAB as a function so I'm plotting pressure coefficient on the y-axis versus the uh, angular location theta around the surface of that cylinder. You, that, that, that equation just gives me this blue curve shown on this slide. So the stagnation points here are located at theta equals zero. Uh, so C, theta equals zero is kind of the three o'clock position uh, as we've been sketching this flow. And there's also a stagnation point located at theta equals pi, which is the kind of nine o'clock location on that sketch. And then you'll see that in those locations of those stagnation points, the pressure coefficient is equal to one, uh, as, as indeed it has to be. Uh, and in the location of those, uh, uh, I guess, at, at that at that 12 o'clock position and also at that 6 o'clock position around the cylinder, uh, you've got this minimum of the pressure coefficient, which is just going to be equal to minus 3 in, in, in those locations. So if I, if I plot the pressure distribution around the cylinder, you've got positive CP, or pressure 
pushing inwards, where we've got low velocity, where those stagnation points are located around that cylinder, and we've got negative pressure uh, or pressure sucking outwards where we've got high velocity uh, around that surface of that cylinder. Uh, so there's negative CP, which means there's a, a force acting normally, uh, acting outwards normal to the solid boundary in those locations. So actually, if you plot the... At the moment, I'm plotting streamlines, but if I plot the, uh, the color contours of the magnitude of velocity, you can see that, right? So the blue here is low speed. Actually, the dark blue is zero uh, velocity, and the dark red is the maximum speed in this flow field. And you can see that where there's low speed, the pressure's pushing inwards on that solid cylinder, and where there's uh, high speed, which is the red shading, that pressure is, is, is sucking outwards uh, on, on, on that cylinder. Okay, so what we've calculated is the flow around a, a, a cylinder for 2D inviscid incompressible flow, which for shorthand we'll call potential flow. And we've now got the pressure distribution uh, around a, uh, for the potential flow around a cylinder. So this is an ideal scenario where there's no viscosity and no separation on the cylinder. So uh, you can see that for certain low Reynolds number flows, uh, they adhere quite well to that potential flow solution that we've come up with. Um, so this is a cylinder in a low speed flow. Uh, they, uh, and, and whoever's made this movie has released dye uh, from the left hand side of this figure upstream of that cylinder. And you can see that those streak lines of that dye as it, as it, uh, as it advects through that flow uh, perfectly tracks out that streamline pattern that we've just calculated from that potential flow solution of the doublet, um, uh, 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 of that doublet plus that uniform flow. So, but what I should say is this is a very low Reynolds number flow. It's a very low speed flow. This hasn't been slowed down for this movie. In fact, I suspect it's been uh, sped up. This is a kind of creeping low Reynolds number flow around the cylinder. And in that situation, it perfectly uh, 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 mirrors what we get from that potential flow solution. If you... If we look at a high Reynolds number solution, uh, we get something that's a little bit different. And I apologize, um, I couldn't find a movie where the... I couldn't find a movie where the flow was coming from the same direction. So... Uh, the flow's still coming from left to right, but remember, for our potential flow solution that we were looking at, the flow was coming from right to left. So in this case, which is a higher Reynolds number flow, you've got your cylinder, you've got a high speed flow of gas, or not that high speed flow of gas over that cylinder, and we, we, we can visualize the flow because they've, uh, they've released these streams of smoke I I into that flow. And you can see that at the front of that cylinder, uh, everything matches very well with that potential flow solution, but at some point around that cylinder, those streamlines separate, and then you've got this recirculating region or that turbulent wake uh, 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 the, the, uh, in, in downstream of that cylinder. Okay, so that, the blue curve is the potential flow pressure distribution, all right? And you can see that it's symmetrical between the front and the back of that cylinder. So what does that mean in terms of drag? It's zero drag, okay? And this is, uh, this is, uh, this is, not, this is really de Lambert's pa paradox. So when you get rid of viscosity and, and you ignore that from the flow, uh, you're going to end up with a, a, a symmetrical flow around this solid body, which is going to give you uh, zero drag uh, for, 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 this, uh, for, the, for that potential flow solution. If you look at the real uh, high Reynolds number solution to that flow around the cylinder, uh, uh, you, you can see that it follows that potential flow solution around the front part of the cylinder perfectly, and then at some point where that separation of the streamlines uh, uh, occurs, it deviates from that potential flow solution. And because that flow doesn't follow all the way around the cylinder, 
you don't get this same recovery of pressure at the back of that uh, at the back of the cylinder or there's no stagnation point on the back of the cylinder so there's th there's there's velocity of that flow on the back surface of the cylinder which is going to give you lower uh, which is going to give you lower pressure so what you end up with is this asymmetrical pressure distribution around that cylinder in real life uh, due to that separation on the back half of that cylinder and that separation gives you lower pressure on the back half of the cylinder than the front half of the cylinder which obviously leads to a net drag force uh, for that separating case so there's a bit of a cautionary note there right that these potential flow solutions that we're seeking aren't going to be terribly realistic in cases where we've got massively separated flows and the flow around a cylinder at anything other than very low Reynolds numbers is a massively separated flow it's a bluff body flow so in those situations you wouldn't expect a potential flow solution to give you a, 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 a other than the, at the front half of that body uh, you wouldn't expect that potential flow solution to give you a, a particularly uh, uh, useful view of what was going on so that, that sounds terribly negative right so now I've tortured you for 10 hours and then just told you well we've got to the flow over a cylinder but it's not actually that useful because the flow over a real cylinder would separate so what I should say uh, so that you don't kill me or kill yourselves after the lecture is that um, that's because that cylinder is a bluff body it's a non-streamlined body uh, but but really I guess the utility of potential flow isn't simulating flows around cylinders that flow around the cylinder now becomes another building block flow for us and by adding other building block flows and doing other things to it we can kind of mash it into a more streamlined shape uh, that we know is not going to be massively separated in real life uh, which is actually just heading towards that aerofoil solution that I've been telling you is, is, is coming so uh, that, that flow around the cylinder is still a kind of useful waypoint in this course uh, but it's just, it's just not quite that useful for us just at the moment okay so I've got a few minutes left and I'm just going to throw out there this notion of the potential function which is a kind of complement to the stream function and I'm just going to tell you what it is and, and give you the uh, maybe give you the opportunity to, to have a, a, a think about it before Thursday's lecture so what th this is on page 26 of your uh, of your lecture notes okay so let's just stop uh, worrying about the cylinder and stop defining building block flows we'll come back to that in a couple of lectures time uh, uh, and, and just let me introduce this other way of defining the flow which is the potential function rather than the stream function so if you remember we we've got three governing equations right we've, we've got conservation of mass and we've got conservation of momentum which gives us a, a two equations the x and y momentum and we can't we can't uh, 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 violate obviously any of those uh, conservation equations any of those governing principles of the flow so the stream function we specifically design so that if we design if we define a flow in terms of the stream function psi we knew that it automatically satisfied continuity uh, so we define that u is equal to de psi dy and v was equal to minus de psi dx and then if I substituted those definitions into the equation for continuity uh, what I ended up with for continuity was that de psi dx dy minus de psi dx dy must equal to zero uh, which of course it equals to zero so that definition of the stream function psi sorry the stream function psi was defined from the get-go so that it just satisfies continuity uh, uh, that, that's really what it what it does and then going on from that we, we saw that in order for a flow uh, for, for in order for a given stream function to satisfy con conservation of momentum uh, the Laplacian of that stream function must be zero uh, that that was what we got via Helmholtz's equation uh, which was effectively just telling us that the flow must be irrotational so what we could do is go about this another way all right so we define the stream function so that it 
uh, it, it met continuity, we could also define a different function so that we automatically satisfied that irrotationality uh, con condition. And, and I guess there's... Uh, you won't know why I'm doing this at the moment, uh, and, maybe, and it will become clear, uh, but, but you should at least see that it's possible to do this, all right? And hopefully the why will become obvious um, uh, 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 after Friday, uh, th Thursday or Friday's lecture. So what I could do was define a flow in a sense that it automatically met that irrotational condition. And it would be very simple. I could define a new uh, 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 function, which I'm calling the potential function phi, and I could just define phi such that u is equal to d phi dx and v is equal to d phi dy. And you see that if I defined a flow in that way, when I substitute it back into the, sorry, when I substitute that back into my irrotational, uh, uh, my equation for irrotationality, I'm going to get d phi dx dy minus d phi dx dy is equal to zero. So a flow defined in this way from the get-go is assured to be irrotational. So that, if I define a flow in that way, I automatically satisfy the momentum equations. And then if you substitute that definition for the potential function into continuity, uh, you can see th that I get this other expression that just tells me that the Laplacian of this new function phi must equal zero in order to satisfy continuity. So does that can you see that I could do that? Uh, and again, maybe I, I, I take it that you, you wouldn't know why I would possibly want to do that, but algebraically it's possible to do that. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to what this means in Thursday's lecture. But just to kind of summarize it for you, we, we've got to satisfy continuity. If the flow satisfies continuity and it's irrotational, it satisfies all of our governing equations of motion. The stream function is defined so that it automatically satisfies continuity and it satisfies the momentum equations or that irrotationality uh, via uh, uh, that Laplacian. The potential <coughs> function is defined so that it automatically satisfies that irrotational condition. Okay? And for the stream function to satisfy the momentum equations, we have to have that the Laplacian of the stream function is equal to zero. And for the potential function, to satisfy continuity, the Laplacian equals to zero. So please just review those couple of slides and make your peace with the algebra, and then we'll keep talking about it on, on Thursday. I think it's on now on LMS. You're supposed to submit it a certain number of weeks after you yeah, do the two weeks. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Yes. It looks like a. Yeah, it is a circle. So I thought it could be half of this image, but why it can stand for the whole image? But it's just a circle. It is a circle, but I guess this offset term, this offset term here could be positive or negative. And so the centre of the circle could be up here or here. Well, but actually, the equation could just stand for the half of this. Well, this is a this is a magnitude square. Yeah, it is a circle. It's a circle. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, I see where your question is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I see where your question is. Maybe I should think about that. I, 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 I think there's a positive or a negative solution for the for the offset for the offset of the circle. Um, but I, I need to go back and um, I need to go back and think about that. I, I need to go. Uh,